Jimmy Webster, what were you thinking? Welcome back to Chat Shit. And before we talk about anything else, I saw on my Instagram feed today the clip of Jimmy Webster hitting Jai Simpkin, mm-hmm. and I immediately sent it to Aiden, and I said, this has to be the first thing we talk about. And I'm sure it's the thing everyone's talking about in the AFL community. Yeah. What were your initial thoughts? I I was absolutely disgusted by mm-hmm. what by what I saw on the on the video today. Well, I'll put a little clip in if you haven't seen it. If you haven't seen it, I don't know where you've been. I don't, I don't, you haven't been following AFL this weekend. Maybe you've been on a school camp with no reception, something like that. That yeah, that's the only explanation. But honestly, I was I was being driven. I was in the passenger seat when when I saw this the clip, um, and I there's just no defending it at all i was so disgusted we didn't want to really talk about it before because we wanted to save it for the podcast Mm. but in every other um concussion mro check that you've had there's sort of some little maybe devil's advocate you can sort of uh absolutely play where there's a potential reason why it may have happened we'll get to the pal pepper one in a second i'll I'll talk about the pal pepper one um but this i just cannot see like cannot see an excuse. Yeah. There is I'll I'll let you speak in a second, but this is by far in my most recent years of watching footy, the worst thing I've ever seen on a football field. And it's a preseason game where tension should be running too high, where you shouldn't really lose your head like this. An experienced player, 150 games plus. Yeah, well I'll I'll keep speaking soon, but I'll let you have a have a crack at this. Yeah, with the Pal Pepper thing from last week, obviously he got four weeks. Port Adelaide appeared to be happy with that, did yeah. not uh, did not try to didn't appeal it. Did not try to appeal it, and the Pal Pepper one was reckless. It was really like um, obviously very high contact and really uh, what's what's the word that they use in the MRO? Like it was very heavy contact. I forget. Yeah. I forget um, um, the word that they use. But in at least in his defence, it was moving at fast pace. There were a lot of bodies around, and the Hawthorne player got sort of slung into slung him. into him. Yeah, which so, made the contact a little bit worse. I understand he yes, didn't leave with his shoulder. Yes, though. and. Either way, you shouldn't be leading with your shoulder. Shoulder charging is not a movement that is a valid way to tackle in the AFL. And so when you're doing... And the reason for that is that you leave yourself exposed for these situations. So obviously, obviously I believe Pal Pepper should have got four weeks and it was probably the right call for um, weeks. Yeah, they were happy with it. I reckon that's probably around the right the right slot. But this Jimmy Webster situation, they were in a lot of space. They were like... It, uh, Jai Simpkin was not crouched down or slung down like the Hawthorne player was mm. last week. He was standing up tall. Jimmy Webster, it was late. We were discussing earlier. It was so late. We were discussing earlier. Every time you think about it, it just gets worse and worse. Mm. It was late. He had no... There was no way that he was trying to do anything legal there. That He was not trying to make any sort of well, legal contact. he had time contact. to make a decision about how he was going to bump or tackle or do smother, do anything else. Leaves the air. The yeah. only way... Leaves the he, air? Yeah, leaves the floor, yeah. the ground. The only way he makes any contact with Jai Simpkin there is a shoulder to the head. He's not trying to make mm. any other contact. But and it was quite unbelievable. It's the leaving the ground part that really yeah. gets me. There's a, there's, a, <laughs> there's a conscious thought that he's had to leave the ground, lead with a shoulder... Um, and not even go for a tackle. I understand if he was a little bit late and he went, he was like body on body face mm. tackle and maybe it clips the shoulder on the front. That happens, but this is side on. He's his body is in the air, hits him dead on the shoulder, and Jai Skim- Simpkins just out cold. Yeah, Jimmy Webster's just got to hope that this doesn't leave the tribunal and go to the go to the state courts. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, the comment <laughs> that we saw was bring back the death penalty. I mean, that's the one he highlighted. Um, we obviously don't believe that, funny, but though. it was pretty funny. Um, um, I'll be interested to see how many weeks he gets. I know Nathan Buckley came out and said if Pal Peppers was four, this has to be minimum eight. I look, you know, I said that there was no. The, the crazy thing about this was that there's no real rational defense for the action from Jimmy Webster, but. The only thing I'd say, and it sort of applies to any hit on an AFL field, is that you're sort of expected and trained up to get really aggressive during the game, put in 100% at all times and get yourself fired up, go through a lot of contact and ignore the pain, blah, blah, blah. And it is a difficult thing to put aside, I guess, those animalistic instincts and balance that with making rational uh, rational plays that fit within this law, the laws, except... Look, that applies to any play, and 
every other player in the league and uh, has been able to follow that and this was just violent to be yeah. honest there's there's a there's a bump which leads to a two week suspension then there's this bump which I don't think I've seen before where there is zero excuse yeah. I guess the final thing we can say on this without just ranting on and on is how many weeks do you think it should be and how many things do you think how many weeks do you think it will be okay I think th- I mean this has to be completely stamped out and this mm. Jai Simkin I know it shouldn't shouldn't be taken into account the player that it happens to but I mean he had two concussions last year we just saw Brayshaw retire we saw Paddy McCartan retire for the same reason um, that, it's not a good look for him and it's a terrible time for him as well Jai Simkin concussed twice last mm. year um what I think it should be, I think it should be 12. Yep. Uh, I think it will be, I think 8 makes sense. Okay. I think it should be about 15. Okay. But the last time we saw, just because there's no excuse for it, the last time the last time I saw something, we saw something like sort of this serious was I think the Andrew Gaff on Andrew oh, Brayshaw. Okay. The reason punch. he didn't win the Brown Low. Yes. And... To me, even there, while that was a look, may have looked worse because it was a punch, mm-hmm. it was it was accidental. Andrew Gaff has no record in his career of any uh, dirty play. Of he's known by everyone to be this uh, stand up guy on and off the field, and he was clearly trying to punch Brayshaw in the chest or give him yeah give him a little, which is still not good. Mm-hmm. But players do it to each other, and it was reckless, and he caught him on the chin. Yeah. This was intentionally violent. Yes, uh, and so. It's weird how it's interesting how they're going to weigh that up because sometimes just the optics of a punch looks worse. Um, but I think they'll give him ten weeks. I, I think the only weeks. thing he's got going in his favor is Jai Simkin did walk off the field by himself. That's yeah. the only thing he's probably got. They didn't get stretched off, and he was he was conscious. Yeah, but I think the MRO might see this as an opportunity to say lay down the law to say we need to stamp this out. This has been an emphasis for quite a few years now. Uh, this is an incident where there is really nothing holding us back. Doesn't matter. Like doesn't matter what penalty they give him it's justifiable they, yeah, they can make I, it as big as they want and what defence does he have I think whatever he gets I think it'd be terrible if St Kilda appealed it whatever he's given regardless of how many weeks I think it'd look bad on the club if they do appeal the decision Dep- actually defense, that's not defense. true if it is like 20-25 weeks or something crazy <laughs> like that then fair enough yeah, go, play, go um, play another sport go play netball because yeah. they might just argue oh it's excessive <laughs> stamping down the law um, yeah. anyways um, let us know what you think down in the comments. We are, are disgusted by what I saw. Um, and I've, I've yeah. been looking forward to this chat for the last few hours. Yeah. We're doing this on Sunday evening following the round of games. Um, but we're going to move on to a, a, a little segment we like to call Outrageous Takes. This won't be weekly. It won't be weekly, no. It probably might just be the one time we mm. do it this season. Or maybe we do it at the halfway point. But what we're going to do, we're just going to say three outrageous takes we have for the season. And we're going to review it at the end of the season. Um, so... I won't give you any examples. We'll jump in and you'll sort of get the gist of what this is straight away. We'll probably jump up. We'll do... I'll start. I'll say one and then you go to the next one. Okay. Let's hear it. Nick Dacos will get less than 15 Brownlow votes is my is my first one. <laughs> okay. And I'll I'll explain why. <laughs> okay. That, I'll explain why. That, I feel, is view, that is view baiting. I that feel is, like I need to that just... That is a man saying something that he does not believe so that you are engaged. <laughs> That's incorrect. Okay. I believe... He will get found out this year. I think he's going to struggle as a young player. There are guys that I think this is terrible for are going to specialize in in tagging him and locking his game down. And if you want to beat Collingwood, he's the guy you have to nullify. He gets less than 15 votes here. I am going to stand behind it. I'm not going to show that take the respect of a proper rebuttal. I'm just going to say he's arguably... He's probably one of the best two or three players in the league. Only one player has been able to successfully tag him. Last year, they were he was getting tagged half the games, hard tagged, and it wasn't working. 15 votes. <laughs> okay. Actually, 15 is still a decent amount of votes, so maybe, maybe. That's not our... Actually, now that I think of the number 15, it's not as outrageous as I initially thought. Should I have gone less? <laughs> I don't know. No, as in, it's still outrageous, but it's less unreasonable than I initially thought. As anyway. in, my, my first thought was 20 or less, but I thought that's too many. <laughs> yeah. So I made a 15 to really fit the RA just category. Yeah. When Finn McGuinness had him on two non non I'm telling you, there's going to be more than one person who tags him successfully this year. Yeah, okay. All well, right, what I do mean, you got? My, fir- my first one is, it's going to be, well, it'll sort of be, okay, decently possible to quantify this halfway through the year or at the end of the year. I think Nick Blakey is a top 10 player in the league. Top 10 player in the league. I think he's a top 10 player in the league. Okay, I wouldn't say that's as outrageous as what I said. 
Mm. Um, but top ten is quite a high bar. I'll give a little bit of reasoning. There's, yeah, that for it's a guy an that incredibly didn't high bar. get in the All Australian first team mm-hmm. last year. I mean, I'll let you explain. I'll, I'll, I want you to back it. I'd say there's probably only two defenders I'd put in the in that top ten, which are probably James Sicily and Nick Blakey. And the reason I put James Sicily, you can argue if you think he's like the best defender in the league, but. He does things that other guys just can't do. He's incredibly strong, and when you match that with, I reckon he's one of the most skilled key backs in the league with his with his uh, foot skills and his ability to distribute. Um, but Nick Blakey, the way that he burst onto the scene was by being this explosive player from the back. And well, no, he was he started did he not start as a forward. Or was he... Is he yes, but I'm saying when he sort of exploded as a oh, really okay. high-quality okay. player was as a guy coming from halfback that had a lot of flair and pace, obviously, and mm-hmm. was just willing to just take bounces. And a lethal left foot. Yeah, take bounces and just charge through the middle of the ground. The two question marks... It was immediately he was one of the best at that, at, at creating offense from the back. The two question marks were, can he defend... And like, uh, and is he strong enough? Because he's very skinny. And Elizabeth. two, and two, his like decision making. Because he's very flashy. Can he be consistent? Last season, we saw him become incredibly consistent, very efficient, despite the fact that his his role is to make risky plays to create scoring opportunities, and to try to break through the uh, opponent's defense. And two, we saw him have to step up as a key back and be amazing as a guy that was creating our offense from the back while also play. he played on Charlie Kerno and did a damn good job of and it. And just to add it, he did kick goal of the year um, in a trial game last week. <laughs> yes, a goal of the year. Because I'm a Swans fan, goal of the year should include preseason and it should already be awarded to Nick Blakey. Right, I'm going to say I don't agree with top 10s are an extremely high bar. I think that's something you can get to in the future, especially... With a bit of consistency, I feel like I know he did burst onto the scene as an established defender now, but as a top ten, yeah. I mean, maybe uh, I think top twenty is probably a fair take. I don't mind it. Outrageous. Last thing to say, Nick Blakey, come on the pod. <laughs> anyway, what's your next take, for Aiden? West Coast will get less wins than last year. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, okay. I've seen they got three wins in twenty twenty three. I'm gonna base it off the trial game that they played and the game that they just played in the preseason. Or whatever they these are all preseason games, but the official preseason games they looked horrible. I'm I they, were, they I I watched about I think half of their game that they played. They were so bad. Is it okay if I blend my response into my second take? Trust me. Okay. Okay. Fine. My right. second take is also a West Coast take, which is yeah. considerably more disrespectful. Right. I didn't get is... any wins this year. <laughs> <laughs> not, not not maybe, but that's okay. not what it is. It's okay. So. I watched some VFL footy last year. VFL footy? Yep, and the Brisbane reserves and the Gold Coast reserves were both very good. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they would be more competitive yeah. in the AFL than West Coast in 2024. Honestly, I do get behind that. That's not even outrageous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I was going to flag that with, maybe this is a bit of a view of anyone that I don't actually believe, but I'd love to see West Coast play against Gold Coast reserves. Gold Coast reserves were outstanding. They were last really year. good. They, have they a won lot the of, VFL, didn't they? They have an amazing amount of depth in their squad, and they won the VFL. I mean, this might be outrageous to some, not to others, mm. but this doesn't even seem too outrageous. I haven't looked yeah. at their fixture list in too much depth. I just think I'm just i assuming they've got an easy one because they did finish last. Um, but... If North can do the double over them, I think they play them twice. <laughs> I can't. I can't see any other wins that they get. The only the only wins they could possibly pick up and win games that matter at the end of the season. Okay. Um, I'm gonna stand behind. They get less than three <laughs> wins, not three or less. They get two or less. Yeah. Well, we we need someone in the room to be say to have some common sense here and say, guys, they're they're not that that crap. But they've got to get unfortunately, better. Surely. Unfortunately, we're equally disrespectful. Actually, you know what? You'll see Sam in his power rankings later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, give us your third take. Oh, my third one. So this one's not as outrageous, but I think Adelaide are not going to make finals. Adelaide Crows aren't going to make finals. You've been so hard on the Adelaide bandwagon. I, I have, but they're going to spend the majority of the flip-flops. they're going to spend the majority of the season in a final spot, and they're going to just just miss out. Why do you just flip flop? I need a third. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm moving on. My third take. I couldn't think of a third. My third take, which I don't think is too outrageous, but I think it's a take that you guys might have some some thoughts on that are watching. I think the, the AFLCA, the Coaches Association Award at the end of the year mm-hmm. for Coaches Association MVP mm-hmm. is a more meaningful award in terms of rewarding a player for how they performed in that season than the Brownlow. It'd be nice if that was the case because I think a coach, 
uh, taking admiration for a player on another team is probably mm. better than um, umpires talking about players. I don't think that'll happen just because of the prestige and the history around mm. the Brownlow medal. Uh, but I would love to see it happen. I'm not saying it'll ever be more prestigious. That's not the case. I love the Brownlow medal. We love Brownlow medal mm. night for oh my a God. variety of reasons. Yeah, we but... won't mention it just because YouTube. I don't know what, what the guidelines are. Brownlow night's good. Um, but... I do think that it's a more meaningful award to me in terms of someone uh, an award that rewards a player for consistently playing well throughout the season because um, I think you can play incredibly cons- consistently and do a job for your team, but if you're not, you're not putting up crazy stats, you're not going to get in those three two one votes. Um, whereas if in the coach association award you can have these great games where maybe someone else has a crazy game, but you can still get maybe six votes. Well, a defender could win it exactly. Basically, or, as in I would love that. Uh, if it got more appreciation yeah I more, think it should get more appreciation more media of it, because it's not a lot it's just sort of a simple post on the AFL's yep. thing coaches player of the year is this person that's it <laughs> nothing really even actually happens um, but yeah I'd love if that happened we'll move on to our next segment which is another one we haven't done before um, it's called start bench trade now what it is we're going to say three uh, players that play in a similar position of a similar level and we're going to have a discussion if if there was a game tomorrow Okay, so it's not we don't take age into account here. It's not about if a player is younger or I'd prefer to keep him because he's got a few more years. It's just if they were playing a game tomorrow, would you start them? Would you bench them? Or basically, would you have them out the squad because you can't obviously trade them once the season starts? Start, bench, drop. We'll say that. You found a way to complicate that. I did. <laughs> I should have been a lot more simple than it. Okay, basically, three players. We're going to rank them. All right. The first one, I've got Darcy Moore, Sam Taylor, and James Sicily. Oh, it's just like... Start bench, drop. That's just three of the best key defenders in the league. That is the game. Based on what I said earlier, James Sicily at start. Start. Um, They do play slightly different positions that James Sicily can only be as effective as he is if he has uh, quite size, like key defenders with a bit of size because James Sicily, he's like 6'2 or something, I think. He plays very tall. He plays extremely tall because of his strength and his positioning, but um, he's about 6'2 and... He need like he, it's difficult for him to be as effective as he is without a couple of tall key backs. But if you're playing putting them against each other, I'd start James Sicily. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd bench Sam Taylor. I reckon Ooh. he's the next, probably the next best key defender in mm-hmm. the league. And Darcy Moore, that's nothing against him. He's a phenomenal key defender that just up led his side to a premiership. Two huge he's just, players here. Up against two huge players. Sam Taylor is oh that guy. There's just guys in sports sometimes that just do everything right. And Sam Taylor is one of them to me. I think he's going to be huge this year. I know you're a huge fan. Of, I mean, I'm a huge yeah. fan, but you're an enormous fan of Sam yeah. Taylor. And he's still very young as well. Um, I do the same thing as you. I'll, I'll just bump in if I if I disagree with what you say. Mm. The next one uh, might be tougher for you. Nick Blakey, Jack Sinclair, and a top 10 player in the league, Tom Stewart. Ooh, that's an interesting one. Call off halfback. I'd say out of the three of those, Tom Stewart is obviously the strongest defensively. But who would you start tomorrow? Um, I'd start Nick Blakey okay. which uh, I'm not sure you'd agree with I'm just extremely high on Nick Blakey I think his development has just been so rapid and he still has more room to improve um, Tom Stewart has been so. What, does he have five all Australians now or four I think he has four oh, it's four or five I think he has I'm four not, in the, sure. I think he has four in the last five years um, and he is really really good defensively I think out of those guys in the league who uh, maybe not tall enough to play on key forwards and play play on those key defenders. Uh, play on those key uh, play play on those small forwards. Sorry, uh, Tom Stewart is p- probably the very best, and I'd pick him second and Jack Sinclair. I'd have to cut. I'd swap the top two there. Okay. So I'd have Tom Stewart uh, to start, especially just the versatility you get. He can also play in the midfield. Um, he's just an incredible player as well. And I put Nick Blakey to bench, and I trade Jack Sinclair, even though I'm a huge fan of him. Mm-hmm. If you go check one of our older videos, the top 25 players in the league, I believe I had Jack Sinclair pretty high in there as well. <laughs> Next one, <laughs> Tim English, Max Gorn, and Brody Grundy. Ooh. Start tomorrow. Yeah, Max Gorn. He's just... I think he, this is the easiest one I thought yeah. was going to be a start. Max Gorn's the best Ruckman I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. I'm, I only got to see glimpses of Nata Nui just because of how old we were when we started following football very closely. Probably, yeah. Um, so I'm sure... Uh, Nadanui is probably the closest. 
uh, when he was in his prime. But Max Gorn is is has almost that same capacity in the air as Natanui had. Not in terms of high, like big highlights specking people and that sort of thing, but in terms of consistently winning aerial battles, winning hitouts and everything. He's probably almost as good, but Max Gorn's incredibly skilled and his decision making's just elite for a guy his size and his execution. So obviously Max Gorn won. Tim English, I'd have it too, as much as I'm excited to see Brady Grundy this year. Yeah. Um, when Brady Grundy was at his best, he was All phenomenal. Australian. All Australian multiple times. Uh, but he hasn't been that for a few years. We saw, we've saw, we seen glimpses of it in the preseason and when he was at Melbourne last year, so I hope he brings that back. But for now, Tim English, second. That one, I thought I knew your order before, but it was a test of the bias. <laughs> yeah, true. I've got to say some things every now and again so that I can justify my Nick Blakey top 10 takes, that kind of thing. We'll move on. I do agree with that. We'll move on to the next one. Christian Petrarca, Patrick Cripps, and Marcus Bontempelli. Oh, just go. three absolute bulls of bulls the league. In the midfield. Bontempelli won. Uh, I think he's the best player in the league. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say anything about that. It's tough, isn't it? I know I'd have a number two. You know what I really liked about Cripps last year? Go I on. liked that Cripps, obviously he's got, got his brown low medal, but then the next year he realised that they had a bit more support in the midfield. They had George Hewitt and they had... Uh, very strong Adam Chera and he just like decided I don't need to stack up all these possessions and have to break away and always get my hands on the footy I can play a bit more of a selfless role and he and a really a bit of a defensive role yeah, at times Callum Mills role yeah 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 where he's not always being flashy um, and I really respected that I thought he was but, underrated last year but, but Petrarca's better yeah, I think I'm going to Petrarca yeah, second that was my that was my yeah. three as well next one's really tough I think Nick Dacos LDU and Tom Green you're insane. Nick Dacos is one of the best players in the league. Nick Dacos won. Less than 15 <laughs> votes. <laughs> um, I'll go Tom Green 2 and LDU 3, which again is nothing against LDU, but Tom Green is poised to be extremely good this year and he's probably my pick for the Brownlow. I'm going to say this very quietly, but I agree with that. Okay. but Less than 15 <laughs> votes for sure. The next one, some some younger players, I guess. I guess the last one was actually young as well. Noah Anderson, Will Day, John Newcomb. Teammates. Ah, oh, I like that one. Noah Anderson's better than both of them at the moment. Um, Giant Newcomb has been good for... I'd, he's been at that like almost elite midfield level for two years now, whereas Will Day just showed flashes last year. So I'm going to say, oh, in terms of what I think for 2024, though... Starting tomorrow. Who is starting in Will Day tomorrow? Will Day's so exciting. He has that sort of explosiveness out of the Can midfield. Can also go behind the ball. He did that yeah. a lot last year. Yeah. I really like John Newcomb. He has those games. He, I swear he's had like a couple games each season the last two years. 40 where he's plus touches. 40 plus and just dominates. He, he had a massive he's, game in the, yeah. this preseason. 30, he's 33 plus, I think. His ceiling's so high. I'm going to go John Newcomb at number two. Okay. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have had it that way. Um, I would have. I would put Noah Anderson at number one, Will Day at number two, and John Newcomb at number three. Um, but yeah, just asking you. We're going to the next one. A Toby Green Shea Bolton and Charlie Cameron. Toby Green won. Yeah. Um, Ooh. The the karate kicker is a very good footballer. He's an incredible footballer. Um, mm, Shea Bolton's. There's no one really like Shea Bolton in the league. And I think it's fair to say that they're all unique players because they're probably, the, they're definitely the three best small forwards in the league. That's what I yeah. went for. Him. <laughs> uh, Shea Bolton has the best capacity to, he's the best in the midfield out of those three. He, He's probably Richmond's best midfielder when he plays in there, apart from when Dustin Martin was fit at points last year. Mm. But uh, he's just so valuable in the forward line that he spends most of his time there. Um, I'd say Shea Bolton 2 and Charlie Cameron 3. But I would have had that as well, just because of versatility. Yeah. Um, but Toby Green, probably best player in the league, question mark, maybe? No. Okay, <laughs> um, last one. Jeremy Cameron, Oscar Allen, and Charlie Kerno. I know your number one is, but... I'm Charlie Kerno is... Yeah. is uh, very, very good, and he's the best key forward in the league. Mm-hmm. Then I'd say, ooh. It's tough. Did you say Oscar Allen? I said Jeremy Oscar Cameron. Allen. Jeremy Cameron. He's got it, history behind him. But I think Oscar it Allen's almost goes unappreciated how well Oscar Allen did with such terrible service well, last year. He's got 40-something goals. Yeah. Yeah. I he, think he's, what, he's the captain now as well? Yes. Yeah. And he did so well last year like to kick that many goals so consistently when there were games where West Coast were just struggling to get inside 50s and when they were they were just bombing along without having giving Oscar Allen any advantage on a lead or anything or in any isolation um, so 
I still can't put him above Jeremy Cameron for now. I know Jeremy Cameron's aging, but he hasn't really showed massive signs of dropping off. So Jeremy Cameron, I think, is still a notch above. I would have had the same list as okay. you. But I do think in a few years... Oh, I guess, well, Jeremy Cameron's yeah. a bit older now. But yeah, it's a tough one. But yeah, I think we'll definitely bring that, that segment back. I quite like that one. Yeah. Especially when we have guests on, it might be a little bit more of a chat. Um, but yeah, Nick Dacos, under 15 votes. Remember that. <laughs> Why do you keep saying Okay. That? Now, what we're going to do, we're going to go on to another segment where we're going to say three players we think are going to get their first All-Australian first team. They could have been in the squad before, but they can and never have been... The 22. In the 22. I seem to have a way of complicating things. Now, uh, do you want to start? Yes. Okay. First one is, and I'm pretty sure Aiden will have, also have this player, and I think most people who chat about footy, and if they were talking about this, would have this player. It's Tom Green. Well, I th- yeah, I have him as well. Actually... The one reason why... Um, I, it's definitely not certain just because of the position. Uh, you, the midfield's always stacked. You've got to be extremely impressive in the inside mid position to to get the Australian Blazer. But I think if he doesn't get in that starting team, he'll find a spot on the bench because if, if, if he plays anything like what we expect him to. Well, I mean, he probably... He was very close last year. The only reason yeah. he probably didn't get it was because of the games he missed. He averaged the most disposals a game. Um, he's just ridiculous and you've got him as well I've got him as well yeah I yeah. uh, just contested possession like beast yeah we'll he's, he's sort of got it all the next one I think we might both have as well I think that we do have a third differential but Isaac Quainel I, I know Isaac we're big fans of him as well um, I just thought he should have been in the team last year yeah same same this is sort of the, the theme <laughs> of what, what it is we just players that we narrowly missed out but they haven't got it yet and that's sort of the segment um <laughs> He just doesn't really lose one-on-ones, does he? He's just, yeah. for his position, he's incredible at it. I know we've talked previously about um, there's a stat where uh, the players that he plays on, how effective can his opposition be? And he seems to nullify his opposition the best of any defender yeah. um, in the league. Um, I think of last year, out of every one-on-one contest he had, I think he lost one or two, which if you think about how many times... In a game, he'd have a one-on-one contest with another small forward. It's quite incredible. Taking the best small forward every week. Him or him and Maynard. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think if he has anything like he did last year, and I think he's only going to get better with, with age, um, I think he's definitely a lock in that defensive line. Yeah, I really hope he gets the appreciation this year if he plays like he did last year. Uh, move on to the third one. I'll, I'll start. I don't think you've got it, but I've got Noel Anderson. Now, this is dependent on a few things. It's dependent on how well Gold Coast play this year because to get votes, you usually have to be on the winning team. Um, and you have votes? To, to get Brownlow votes. All Australian. All Australian votes. <laughs> Sorry, I get in the All Australian team. Sorry, to get in the All Australian team and to get noticed, I think you have to be on the winning... It helps to be on the winning team. It's tough to stand out on a team that, get, that gets smashed. And I have Gold Coast potentially sneaking inside the eight. Noah Anderson had an incredible year last year. And I think with Damien Hardwick, he might just potentially get the best out of him. He's incredible in transition. Um, He's not a top 10 player in the league, but I think he's got a future being that. So I'm just going to take a punt on this one. I'm going to say Noah Anderson gets his first All-Australian. I like it. I've got Nick Blake here and I've talked about him enough. Yeah, we can can probably leave the chat. Um, I reckon he's in. We'll move on to... uh, Sam segment, which we did last week. I'm not sure how much you heard. I know the audio was a bit messed up. We're still trying to figure out how to use two microphones, but we've gone back to what we know works. <laughs> We're going to go to the, the power rankings. So we've done this following the trial games, but yeah. now we've had the proper preseason games where it's players that are actually going to play um, and not just in the second half of games. They've got random youth players that aren't really going to get any time this season. You want to take that a bit closer to the camera? Yes. So the preseason games don't mean as much as a game in the actual season because still teams are trialing things out and uh, sort of not taking it, not going 100%, I'd say. Mm. But it shows it shows you a, a fair amount. But I've got just a few changes to make. I don't want to be too reactive mm. to the preseason games. But I'll... I'll, I'll, I'll set yeah, get a bit closer. Get a bit closer. Yeah, yeah, yeah take it around. Take it around. Let, let the people see. Yeah, don't worry about that still. That's okay. Let's, let's move this. That's okay. All right. The first... Uh, let's go from the, the top down. With the Swans injuries... Since the last time we did the power rankings, Luke Parker... Taylor Adams. Out for four weeks. Taylor Adams out for four weeks. No, Luke Parker will be more than four weeks. It's, they said roughly four weeks for four both. Four weeks. It, oh, wow. Parker might be both. That's it might be more, though. Recovery. 
I'm going to put them down to four. I still think I expect them to be one of the best four teams in the league alongside Collingwood, Brisbane, and GWS. Um, they're strong all over the field, and I we I think they have good troops to fill in for Adams, Mills, and Parker. Sheldrick. They're, they're our three most experienced inside midfielders. Well, Mills isn't going to play the first round either. Yeah, of course, and we're, we're missing all of them. But it just shows the depth we have, and we're going to get that development out of Warner, Rowbottom, Sheldrick, potentially Matt Roberts, we James to Jordan. A, we want to have a huge year this yep. year. Isaac Heaney will probably have some midfield time. All those guys will chip in. And I think it's, in a way, a positive thing that those guys will get that experience in there to have to carry the load and be the leaders in the midfield until Adams, Parker, and then eventually Mills come back into the side. The first four to five weeks will be very interesting to yes. see how the Swans can perform and get off to a really good start to propel them into a place where you think they might finish. Definitely. The next I'm going to do is I'm going to move St Kilda up above Carlton into fifth and Carlton into sixth. Um... I think St Kilda have been incredibly impressive in the preseason. They won the preseason premiership, as it's called, by winning both games and uh, having the highest percentage in the trial and the preseason game. But uh, they look good all over. I really like their team. I think, for whatever reason, people continue to underrate them over the last few years, but they keep coming back to finals. And with Ross Lyon at the helm, having, Ross- a, having a year to set the system, were you going to say Ross the boss? Yes. Fair enough. I think they look really, really good and poised to... To be great, I know people are very high on Carlton. Some people, I saw someone predicting Carlton to win the premiership. Um, I don't quite see that. I just do want to preface as well. This is a power rankings based on form. And vibes. And vibes, yeah. Form and vibes. This isn't <laughs> how we think it might finish at the end. What would this happen, what the ladder looks like at the final round could be different to what the ladder actually looks like. Yeah. yeah. Now, I regret moving Sydney down. I hate this. Uh, the next one I'm going to do is I'm going to move Bulldogs above Essendon and Gold Coast. How good does Riley Sanders look, by the way? Riley Sanders looks amazing. Marcus Bontempelli and Tim English do still exist. And Bulldogs looked good against Hawthorne. Yes, Hawthorne's an experience. Like they're, they're a young team who aren't going to always uh, play the best footy, and it was the preseason match. However, B- Bulldogs did look very good. Only just missed out on finals last year, and I sort of needed to... Uh, get a sense of that, and Essendon and Gold Coast are also a part of this, and they didn't uh, uh, they didn't really impress. Fair enough. Um, Gold Coast lost badly to GWS, which is which is fair enough because I think GWS are probably the best team in the league. But if they want to see themselves as a top eight side under Damian Hardwick, I know that they need some time to develop that system. But they're going to have to be competing against everyone. Have to be in every game. The final one is West Coast to go to nineteen. I'll take that. <laughs> no, they need to prove why they deserve to be... No, I'm joking. They, they're still there. But uh, we've given enough West Coast disrespect uh, so far, but I really want to see them compete and be, play I some fun AFL games. It, to be fair to the league, West Coast need to win games. Yeah. I know there was, there was some talk last year how it's a bit of an imbalance if you get to play West Coast twice, it's two free wins, whereas the teams that only get them once or them in North Melbourne, but more West Coast. Yeah. Um, so I'm really hoping they can be competitive. Obviously, my outrageous take says they're going to get two or less wins this year. But honestly, just be competitive. Like, stay in some games. Don't get blown out in the first quarter by 40 points. And, and Easier the said over. than done. It is easier said than done. Um, Harley Reid has had some positives, but he's not their saviour this season. Yeah. We'll move on to a little five to ten minute uh, Super Coach AFL chat. Obviously, we do have a league... Um, the description is down below. We'll put it right and here. And there'll be the lead code there. The lead code will be right here on the screen. <laughs> right here. Right here. I'll see how... Wait, do they do the Hungry Jacks thing? What's that? It's just how you hold the burger. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to test my editing skills there. <laughs> but yeah, I'll put it right there. It's going to be in description every video as well. Um, we want to see you down there. Uh, there's no prize for winning, but then we can always chat if you have a really good week. Um, let us know down in the comments. Um, if you need any assistance, if you want to ask to rate your team, um, but yeah, yeah, every every now and again we're just gonna have a little chat about Supercoach. I don't really have anything to say. I just want to see how you're finding it as your fir- in your first season. I've gotten Aiden really into it, and he he's more into it than I am, which I, I love to see. It's really tough. I, I found <laughs> after every game, I just go look who are the who are the young guys? How cheap are they? How many disposals are they getting? Yep. Is there value in it? Yeah. I've st- this preseason after every single preseason game, I think I found myself making a change. Mm. Um, 
that's not good to be reactive. Uh, I, but I'm I'm happy that round zero doesn't count because I'm still not locked in. Um, I've got about eight people so far uh, in my in my team that I think are locks, and the rest can still be changed around. I'm absolutely loving the super coach yeah. though. You know the the emotional aspect is that that you'll you'll find is you have players that you're like. I see something in this guy that no one else sees, and you're like, I want to get ahead of the get ahead of everyone else by picking this guy. But just because you see, you think you see something that no one else sees, doesn't mean that they're a good value super coach. Yeah, you know what? It it, it hurts when I um <laughs> when they post about like Riley Sanders, and then I look at the comments on the post on Instagram, and they're like, lock for super coach. Because it means ha- you're not going to get any differential. And it means I'm not going to get a differential. And I really want to get a differential. <laughs> and I've got one. I'm not going to say it yet. <laughs> You'll see it after round one if you join the league. And we'll t- we'll talk about it. But I just want to keep him to myself. Um, but yeah, it is quite tough to get those those pods. Is, is, yeah. what, is what you call them in the Supercoach world. I'm trying to help him make sure he doesn't have have doesn't have any too many mid-prices. Supercoach players will know. I have, I've made a few changes since yeah. you, you advised me against the guys between like 200 and... 400,000, 200,000, yeah. 500,000 even. Um, I will make a recommendation to anyone who is still watching this video and is playing A-plus Supercoach. Do not pick Nick Dacos at the start. <laughs> I'm going to say this now. He comes up against Finn McGuinness in the first couple rounds and then they have a bye. Finn McGuinness, that's what, probably so, four disposals max Finn McGuinness is going to take him out of the game. You're not going to get any points there. He's going to lose some value and then the bye comes. I think after the bye, there's a decision to be made. But if you're going to pick between Nick Dacos and someone like Tom Green or Marcus Bontempelli, there's a very easy decision here. Do not pick Nick Dacos. I know some people won't agree with me. I don't think you agree with me. Look, Nick Dacos is like the number one guy we want to eventually have on the pod and you're killing our chances this entire episode. Maybe, maybe, hey, he'll never hey, watch this. Hey, he'll never you watch know this. what? Maybe me slandering him <laughs> gets, the, gets, gets the views. Maybe yeah, the yeah, view yeah. count goes up because he's not going to get yeah. more than 15 votes this year. I'm going to be really hard on that. And I know you're going to keep... Uh, an updated Brownlow count of what you think what oh, yeah. you believe and I want to know when Nick Dacos hits 15 in your count yeah. uh, just to do a little bit of shameless flexing it, it was it was pure luck but two years ago I, is the only time I've done that where every game I sort of even if I wasn't able to watch it I went through the match report and the highlights and did my 3-2-1 vote um, and I, it did pick Patrick Cripps as the winner when he was the third betting favourite and he, and he won it that was probably pure luck, but now I have a false sense of confidence. Life, that I'll do life peaked back then. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, that's all we have today on on the podcast. Let us know down below if there's any little segments that you want us to do. But what this is going to be is Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening when we record this. It's just going to be a review of the the match week that's gone, the the biggest talking points. Um, we're going to spend forty five minutes to an hour having a chat. Um, and eventually, we're going to start populating the back here. We haven't exactly figured out how we're going to do it. And also, if you know how to get two microphones working with the audio, <laughs> please let us know down in the comments because I can't seem to get it working. Um, and if you're still watching, just that that's a great way of showing us that you've made it through the whole video. Just say, this is how you work two mics, or I don't know how to. That would be <laughs> awesome. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the podcast. We feel like we're getting better at it. And we hope you had a good time. And we'll see you all on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.